I'm going to give away my age a little bit this morning. I was born in the 80s, but I am thoroughly a 90s kid. And one of my favorite movies as a kid is Disney's Aladdin. Make way for Prince Ali, Ali Baba. I found myself even re-watching the clip just this morning to make sure I remembered the fullness of it. Picture the scene there of Ali, Aladdin, coming into Agrabah, and the song going, Make way for Prince Ali. All the commotion, all the drums, the elephants sounding, the noise to make way for the coming prince to propose to Jasmine, to try and win her as a suitor. The way had to be set even as the sound rang out. This is the way of the coming of a prince, but even more so of a king. You know, it's not just Ali that had to have his way prepared and made way for. Our King Jesus had his way made. The highway of heaven was cleared and made ready for the coming of the king by one named John the Baptist. This morning we look at John the Baptist and his ministry to prepare the way of King Jesus as we turn our attention this morning to Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, so the whole of the chapter. You can find that passage uh, there on page 960 in the Red Pew Bible. If you do not have your own copy of God's Word, I invite you to, to grab a copy there and turn to page 960. While you're turning there, the, the last few weeks we have been working our way through Matthew 1 and 2 and seeing really the introduction to Matthew's Gospel, seeing that Matthew is setting us up to turn our eyes to this Jesus and who he is. Matthew and his way of introducing us to Jesus has taken us through Jesus' genealogy. He has taken us through Jesus being the one who has come to fulfill all the promises of old. He has come to fulfill the promises to Abraham and to David, being the son of David and Abraham. He has come to bring blessing to the nations. He has come to be the one who is the right and true king of Israel. This is who Matthew has set us up to see, that he is the one who is this one to save us from our sins. And in Matthew 2, we got to see over two weeks both this baby Jesus threatened by Herod, that Herod was fearful of this king, and yet as all of Jerusalem was troubled that one has been born king of the Jews, Magi from the east came to worship him. They traveled from afar to worship this one who has been born king of the Jews. And then last week, we saw how Herod went through his plot to kill Jesus and how those were responding in various ways to his coming. We had that of indifference even in it uh, two weeks ago. And then last week, we saw how Jesus was preserved and being sent into Exodus to bring about a new Exodus, a new coming out from this sin. This is where Matthew's been building us. And yet this morning we conclude that introduction in reality as the way for the king is made ready through John the Baptist and his ministry. As we come to the reading of God's word, I'd like to invite you this morning to stand as we read the whole of Matthew chapter 3. This is the word of the Lord from Matthew. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all of Judea and all of the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? 
bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. The message of repentance is what we come to this morning in Matthew chapter 3 from John the Baptist. If I have wrestled and understood this text correctly, and if I'm doing this whole expository preaching thing correctly, which is the, the goal is to take the main point of the passage and make it the main idea of the sermon, this is it. Jesus alone fulfills all righteousness. Therefore, if we are to enter his kingdom, we must turn from our sin and repentance. That's it. Jesus alone fulfills all righteousness. Therefore, if we are to enter his kingdom, we must turn from our sin in repentance. We're going to unfold this in three points this morning. These are, are the handlebars of the sermon to help you hold on and know where we're at. Point number one, the message of repentance. This is verses one through six, the message of repentance. Point number two, the fruit of repentance. This is verses seven through twelve. And point number three, the fulfilling of righteousness. Verses 13 to 17. Sorry, I couldn't find a way to make repentance fit in there. But they're the same length. The message of repentance, the fruit of repentance, and the fulfilling of righteousness. That is our points this morning. Point number one, the message of repentance. Verses one through six. Repentance is one of these phrases that we often in today's time do not like to hear, and it's certainly one we don't like to talk about. It, it's one of those that makes you often uncomfortable, and yet it is essential, and it's the way that the King's Highway was prepared by this message of repentance. It's, it's essential to what true biblical Christianity really is. In fact, this is why John goes to preach it. Verse 1, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. We are introduced here to one who is a very unique character of John the Baptist. I mean, look at the way this John is described even here in chapter 3 down in verse 4. Now, John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. He's a wilderness man. He would have fit in perfect in the North Woods. He's a truly burly man, eating from the land of locusts and wild honey. But that's not all about John. There, there's clues giving us who he is. We know from Luke's Gospel in Luke chapter 1 that this John the Baptist is the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah, that he is the cousin of Jesus, that this Baby, or when he was a baby in his mother's womb, he left at the sound of hearing Mary's voice. That's part of who John is. But there's more here, too. The very fact that it describes him in the fourth verse 
there that he wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey, is to point us to him coming in the likeness of another. 2 Kings 1 8. They answered him. He wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. This John the Baptist is Elijah come back. We'll get more into that in chapter 11. But hear how Jesus himself goes to affirm this in Matthew 11, 14. And if you are willing to accept it, he, being John the Baptist, is Elijah, who is to come. This John the Baptist is no ordinary man. He's no ordinary prophet. He is the one that comes after Elijah in his likeness. He comes to preach the message and prepare the highway of the kingdom. But even as, as John the Baptist begins to preach here, as we read here in the second and third verse, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. This John the Baptist is the one long foretold from Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 43. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The highway is being prepared here by John the Baptist as he comes. He's making ready for the way of the king to enter and be ushered in for his ministry to begin. He is preparing it now. How? By preaching. He comes and preaches in the wilderness of Judea by the Jordan River. Now, let it be said, this is probably not necessarily the wilderness we think of when we look out our doors. We see the wilderness of trees. This is more referring to the desert, the abandonment, the isolation here. John the Baptist, as he goes to prepare the way of the king, he goes outside the camp of Israel. He goes outside the temple, outside the gates of Jerusalem, so that he can show and preach and model that the people stand outside of God's camp. And he's urging them to come back in, to be brought in through this message of repentance. It's through God's ordinary means of grace, through the preaching and proclamation of of God's word that John the Baptist goes to do this work, to call a people back to himself through this message of repentance. Before we can, though, unfold what it means of repentance and what it is, what it looks like, we must first see why he goes to preach this message. Why are they outside the camp? A little word for friends, I one of the ways we do good Bible study and understand our, our Bibles well is to look for these transition words, for these words that help us to understand what's going on. This for is a grounding clause to say, why this message of repentance? Why? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How does he make straight the way of the Lord? By preparing the, the path for the coming of the king. We hear that word kingdom, though. It's not like that of uh, a fantasy kingdom of Agrabah or Camelot. It's not like that of olden days of thinking of, of towers and pillars, of, of brick walls and knights on horses. It's not that kind of kingdom. That's not the kingdom that they are urging for. This would have been a, a clear stumbling block for many in Jesus' day and in John's day and even in our day. The kingdom is not a geopolitical one. It's not that kind of kingdom. It is a different kingdom. A kingdom of God. John the Baptist comes preaching a message of repentance to make ready for the coming kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. He is preparing the way for God's rule to enter the world once more. Before objections begin to fly in our minds and thinking, wait, doesn't God already rule? Isn't he the sovereign ruler of everything? Yes, he is, friends. 
He is the sovereign one over all things. He's sovereign over every event, even as we know from Genesis and the story of Joseph being led into uh, Egypt in slavery, or uh, as sold as a slave by his brothers. What his brothers intended for evil, Joseph says, God intended it for good. So yes, God is sovereign even in the midst of our broken world. But here's the reality. For Israel and for us, we have not come under that rule. We have not subjected ourselves as servants under that rule in recognition of him as king. For Israel, they have rejected God as king in seeking to be like the other nations. They have rejected his rule, and therefore they have been cast into exile and even brought back, and then they have strayed again. Over and over again, the nation of Israel threw off God's rule, his right and good law from them. They wanted to be their own kings. And so John comes preaching this message, preparing the way of the kingdom of heaven, at, calling it at hand to say, God's rule is coming, whether you like it or not. It's coming into the world. The question is, will, what will you do about it? How will you respond to that news? He's preaching this message so the people can make ready for God's coming kingdom. This is what he desires. And so John the Baptist, through the preaching message of repentance, is preparing the way of the kingdom, making people ready and understand God's rule is coming. The question is how? And what will I do? How? Well, that he calls the people to repent, to turn from their sins. I love how Daniel Durrani puts it here. He says, most fundamentally, to repent is to return to God, to his covenant, to loyalty and obedience. This is what it means to repent, to return to God, to his covenant, to loyalty and obedience. And this is what the message John the Baptist is preaching. This call to people to turn back to God. John is warning his people that they need to seek to come under God's rule as loyal and loving subjects. They need to obey the king in his laws. They need to stop trying to be their own kings and rule and defining what is good and evil. They need to stop it and come under this kind of rule. Friends, this is not just for them. We too are in danger of it. We too are in danger of needing to hear this message of repentance and being coming back under God's rule because the reality is we all seek to be our own kings. And yet, here the message is calling us to repentance, God's gracious invitation, inviting us back in from being exiles to coming back home to him. Notice what happens here is John goes and preaches this message of repentance for the kingdom of heaven is at end, verse 5. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. We see here the people all come to hear the message that John is giving. They come to see his work of baptism, and they are hearing this message, this call to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and they are turning back to God. They're confessing their sins and being baptized. Friends, confession of sin, repentance, and baptism, they go hand in hand. They are so tightly tied together. Confession of sins is the very heart of repentance because it's a first an acknowledging of wrongdoing and acknowledgement of guilt and acknowledgement of God's judgment is deep right. And part of the reason some struggle to repent is because they don't recognize their own guilt. They don't recognize as those who have rebelled against God and needing to turn. Therefore, confession of sin, acknowledgement of wrongdoing, and God's right judgment deserved against that sin 
That has to be at the first step of repentance. But it's more than that. It, it, it's sitting there coming and into the waters of baptism as John is doing as they confess sins, he is baptizing them. By God's grace, we get to celebrate baptism this morning. And, and during part of that baptism, you're going to hear me at the end say, buried with Christ, or buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. That's the reality of what baptism symbols. It symbols that inner working of the heart, inner repentance of dying to the old and being raised anew in Jesus. Of a heart change, of a mind change to come under God's rule. This is why John comes and prepares the way by preaching this baptism of repentance, calling people to repent and to be washed of their sins and trust in God's mercy and grace. That's what's happening here. And again, friends, we are all sinners. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. As David writes in Psalm 51, in my mother's womb, I was conceived in sin. Friends, from the very moment we enter this world, we are sinners. We don't have to teach our children to sin and to seek their own way to try and justify what they did, even if it's wrong, even if they know it's wrong. We don't teach them to sin. They pick it up. It's in their nature. It's in our nature. We are sinners by birth. And yet, the message here is a call to turn from this allegiance to sin and back to God, recognizing Him and Him alone as King. Him as the one who calls the shots, and I'll submit to that. Friends, we need to see that despite what sin has entered our life, and we've all been guilty of it. We've been guilty of telling that little white lie. We've been guilty of committing adultery and murder in our hearts. We have been guilty of worshiping other gods and turning to idols. I'm going to paraphrase David Platt because I, I don't remember the exact quote, but he talks about some of the biggest worship gatherings happening on Saturdays in the South. I'm a graduate of the University of Tennessee. I work for the football team. 102,000 filled that stadium on a Saturday in the fall. 92-something thousand in Ryan Denny, the University of Alabama. 93 or 4,000 in the University of Gainesville, or Florida in Gainesville. Thousands gather and worship a sport. People give more time, energy, and attention to that than they give God even on a Sunday morning. Friends, the idols in our hearts were given to. This is sin that we need to repent of. And yet, here again is God's gracious call to repent, to turn to Him, to come under His rule once more. Friends, let us hear this. Let us hear this message of the gospel and turn to God. I want to quote John Calvin here because he sums up this gospel so well. Calvin writes, The sum of the gospel is that God through his Son takes away our sins and admits us to fellowship with him, that we denying ourselves and our own nature may live soberly, righteously, and godly, and thus may exercise ourselves on earth and mediating on the heaven, meditating on the heavenly life. Friends, this is the gospel, and this is how we respond in repentance, dying to self and rising new in Christ. Let us repent accordingly. But friends, the call to repentance is not a one-time thing. It's a call to continue bearing fruit in repentance. Point number two, the fruit of repentance. Verse seven, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? The Pharisees and Sadducees are two different groups that they're both recognized as the religious leaders of the day. They both think of themselves as those who have it all together and no need of a physician because they're already well. We'll see their rejection even here in a moment. They think that 
by having their fancy robes with all their tassels dragging from them, that they are good standing. And therefore, as John sees them come to his baptism, he sounds a warning. You brood of vipers. Essentially, you sons of snakes. But even more so, you sons of the great snake, the devil. He calls them children of Satan here. He calls them out and says, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Because that's what this call, this ministry is. Because he expects them to be there to judge his ministry as they rightly were. So he sounds this morning. Friends, this may seem harsh, but yet this reality this morning of hypocrites within our midst, those who are imposters of this faith, need called out. One pastor from the 1700s, Charles Simeon, writes this. When a profession of a religion has become fashionable, as it were in common, it is necessary for ministers to be doubly careful that they do not sanction it much less promote the delusions of hypocrites or imposters. At such seasons, peculiar faithfulness and discrimination will be wanted, that the upright may not be discountenanced, nor the vain pretenders to piety be encouraged. Friends, John the Baptist here labors to make plain those who profess repentance without actually being genuine they're imposters. They need to be seen as what they are, sons of Satan. He goes on to, to correct and to show what is lacking in them. Verse 8, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Imposters will not bear fruit in keeping with repentance. They will have no sign of change in their lives. These religious leaders in Jesus' day, they had their fancy robes, they had their tassels, they appeared religious, but there was no sign of their desiring the things that God desired. They did not show mercy and compassion. They set up, set up extra boundaries around God's law to appear religious, and yet they were far from God. And before one could object of, of this call of John the Baptist for them to be a brood of vipers and, and to need to repent and keep with repentance, John anticipates it there in verse 9. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Their religious birth, had, or their birth, of being sons of Israel had nothing to do with their salvation. They had no right to say they were sons of God because they were Israelites. And how much more true does this apply to us in our day and time? Kids in particular, but some of you adults, I don't care that you grow up in the church. Neither does Jesus. It doesn't matter if you grew up in a Christian home with Christian parents. Their faith is not able to save you. Friends, it matters not even if you have prayed a prayer repeating after somebody who told you to do so and prayed and asked Jesus to come into your heart. That is not the assurance of your salvation. It's a weak assurance. It's a weak imposter. Some of you even have been involved in churches and been joined in, as members into the church. You've gone through the waters of baptism, and yet all of these matter not if there is no repentance and a keeping with repentance. If there's no very fruit of that repentance, of that faith, it is for nothing. Repentance is foundational for the Christian life. It is necessary for anyone to turn from their sin back to God in allegiance to Him, or there is no salvation. The religious garb, the religious practices mean 
nothing. Some of the greatest ones in danger of hell sit in churches throughout our nation because they believe themselves religious of some way, but yet they have never turned from sin, acknowledging it, and turned back to God in that repentance. Friends, let us be warned of this. And yet at the same time, let us be encouraged in it. I love what Spurgeon sums this up with. He says, let none of us, because we are orthodox or exceedingly spiritual in our religious observance, dream that we must therefore be in the favor of God, and that we are under no necessity, we are under no necessity to repent. God can do without us, but we cannot do without repentance and the works that prove it true. Repentance and bearing fruit are essential. Repentance in that of, of means that we are constantly repenting. We are ongoing in our repentance. It's not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing process of continually turning from sin back to God in various ways. Friends, our actions, our, our words, our deeds should show this bearing fruit. Now, it's not a call to perfection, but it's a call to progress, to see that visible fruit. How can we call an apple tree without any apples an apple tree? How can we call an orange tree without any oranges an orange tree? How can we call a Christian without bearing fruit of repentance a Christian? We can't. But we need to look for these signs of bearing fruit and be encouraged. Friend, if you are one here in this room this morning or, or watching on our live stream and you claim to be a Christian without any signs of this fruit, friend, let me warn you, you stand not with God at this moment. And yet, by God's grace, you are here hearing a message this morning, this call to true and biblical repentance, and the prayer is that you will hear it in turn. This is God's grace to you, to Hear this call to turn from sin and turn to God to repent of your sin and believe. Friend, be saved today. Turn from sin and come back to God. Enter his kingdom and have hope. The note that apart from repentance, this is what lays before you. Verse 10. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. This is the warning. The axe is ready to chop down the tree without fruit, the sinner without fruit, because this is the judgment that stands against them, because they have not actually turned and prepared to enter God's kingdom. But it's not John that does this. John's not the one who's going to judge. Verse 11, I baptize you with the water up for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Verse 12, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. It is not John the Baptist who stands to, to carry these things out, to be the one to chop down these fruits. It's not me as a minister of the gospel. It is the Lord Jesus himself who comes to chop down the trees of those that bear no fruit and call themselves religious and final God. These will not inherit God's kingdom, but be cast out into a place of fire, unquenchable fire. If you've never felt the Eat a flame. It is hot. May a brush fire out of control. It can cause you to sweat and just, you can feel it radiating from the flames. But eventually that fire will go out at some point. Even if it kills somebody in the line of duty and being a firefighter, the smoke will likely kill them before the flames ever will. But the unquenchable fire here never ceases. It never stops consuming, and yet you feel it. That's the judgment that awaits these who fail to repent, who fail to bear good fruit in it. And yet, lest the, the, those 
are tempted to doubt, who are sensitive in the spirit, friend, before you ever turn to doubt. I want to encourage you to turn to a mature brother or sister in Christ and say, what fruit do you see evident in my life that you may be encouraged? Because to bear fruit is visible. It's visible to others. It should be visible in your own life to see that God is at work empowering you to be bringing that change. Change. For yes, friend, we are saved by faith alone, in, by grace alone, in Christ alone. This is how salvation comes. And yet, that same grace that is powerful enough to save is powerful enough through the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus baptizes his people with is powerful enough to bring about this change over and over again. There will be visible fruit. It will not be because of you, but because of God's Spirit in you. It will produce these works. Ever how slow it looks. Sometimes, friends, bear fruit. It sometimes does get confusing. Am I really bearing fruit? And yet, friend, look back over the last month, look back over the last year, and ask yourself, how is God helping me to love others more? How is he helping me to be more gracious to others, even in the midst of not deserving grace? How is God increasing my love for him, and how is he increasing my hate of sin? Friends, these are the visible fruit that should be tangible for us to see. What ways are we learning to die to self and be more self-giving? These are the tangible fruits that we should see and bear in keeping with repentance. It's a slow, messy process, and yet it is a process. And the Christian who is truly repentant will continually grow in each of these Maybe a little at a time, but you will see that growth. And others can help you. Just like as being with parents, as parents, you don't always see the mass changes in your children because you're with them day to day. Christian, just like with your sin, you see your struggles day in and day out, but others can have a better look and see that progress in you. Just like grandparents can so rightly point out the changes in your own children that you as parents are too blind to see because you're with them over and over. Turn to one another and be encouraged. See how they are seeing God bear fruit in your life and be encouraged in that. Friends, but why all this talk of repentance? What, what does this do in us? Why is it possible that we're able to turn from sin and enter God's kingdom? Well, it's not because of us. Point number three, the fulfillment of righteousness. Verses 13 and 14. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Could you imagine being in John the Baptist's shoes and being the one to, to be told, I need to be baptized by you? No. John rightly tries to reject him. He has already said that he is not even one worthy to loosen or carry Jesus' sandals as a servant, let alone baptize him. And yet, how does Jesus respond? Verse 15. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. Jesus comes here to fulfill all righteousness, to enter the waters of baptism. But why? He's one without sin. He is the Lamb of God. He is innocent. He has no need to confess sin. And yet Jesus comes to enter the waters of baptism to fulfill all righteousness. What righteousness must he fulfill? By identifying with his people in their sin. Just like Daniel in exile prayed a prayer of confession on behalf of the Israelite people to God, so Jesus identifies with his people in public and corporate confession of confession of Israel's shortcoming and him saying, I identify with you to take on your sin so that you can confess it together and come through the waters of that you can come through this baptism of fire and be saved. Jesus identifies with us 
Spurgeon here says, Baptism was becoming even in our Lord, who needed no personal purification, for he was the head over all things to his church, and it was becoming that he should be as members should be. Baptism beautifully sets forth our Lord's immersion in suffering, his burial, and his resurrection. Thus, typically, it fulfills all righteousness. Jesus here identifies with his people in saying, I have come as the suffering servant. I am the one who is going to fulfill all of this so that you can enter God's kingdom. Despite your sin, if you will just turn from it and trust in me and my righteousness, I will fulfill it. We see this further. Verses 16 and 17. It says, And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. And behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And Jesus being faithful and obedient to that of baptism, as soon as he rises, the heavens part. The voice of God sounds out and says, This is my beloved Son, in with whom I am well pleased. The Spirit descends and remains on Jesus. Friends, I, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. In the Old Testament, the Spirit comes and goes. It comes on the prophets and goes. It does not remain. We see this clearest in Saul. The Spirit of God ascended on him and then left him. But in Jesus, it comes and stays. And therefore, it's a picture of his Spirit coming to all who belong to him. But more importantly here, we see not only does the Spirit descend upon him, identifying for John that this is the one that was promised would come, God's voice rings out declaring what we have already been told, that this is Emmanuel, God with us. The Father speaks and says, this is my Son, the Son of God. Making sure we know without a shadow of a doubt this is his son. This is his beloved son who has come as he prepares to enter ministry. But not only that, he says that this is the one whom I am well pleased. This is encouraging as it stands on its own, but friends, this fulfills further prophecy. Isaiah 42, 1 says, Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, and whom my soul delights, I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. This is the one whom God's soul delights in, who has come to bring deliverance for God's people. This is the one who has come to do this. How? As the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. The one who would be called a man of sorrow, stricken, smitten, and afflicted, who would be pierced for our transgressions. This is the son whom God is well pleased with, the suffering servant, who will bring about the salvation of the nations. That all will trust in him and his righteousness will be saved. If they will but turn from their sin and rest in Jesus and Jesus alone for their salvation. Friends, this is the message of Repentance. This is the baptism of repentance that John proclaimed long ago and that we must continue to proclaim today. We must proclaim this call to repentance. Both as Christians, we need reminders. We need to keep bearing fruit. That we need to continue to see God at work in us because this is part of his Holy Spirit at work in us. We need to see evidence of that. But friends, if you have yet to believe again, I urge you, hear this call and repent and believe. But friends, this is also a call for us as Christians once more. How does God proclaim his message so that people may hear and respond accordingly? It's by preaching, proclaiming, heralding this message so that others may hear. Friends, there, there's a little white lie out there that says that, you know, I, I must preach the gospel and when necessary use words. Friends, you can't preach 
the gospel without words. Your lives must match what you proclaim, but you must use words. God started this through his servant, John the Baptist, preaching and heralding the message in Judea along the Jordan River. The people heard. They responded. Jesus came and modeled for us. Let us preach this message. And may others come and hear and confess sins and enter the waters of baptism and be cleansed from their sins so that they can enter heaven's gates, that they can be with God for all eternity. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let us continue in bearing fruit with repentance. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning, for your word and your message. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would be a people who would continue to bear fruit in repentance, that we will continue to turn from our sin and show how your spirit is at work in us and through us, changing us by your grace. Father, Lord, even now, Lord, as we see the visibleness of this working of the spirit, Lord, that we would rejoice. Father, we ask and we pray this in Jesus' name.